All right, so the first uh, case we had is an otherwise healthy guy, 65 years old. I thought his last name was interesting uh, based on the pathology, he's German uh, of origin. He had some high blood pressure, but I believe that was it, normal airway exam. He needed a right knee manipulation, so our plan for induction was for his airway was just to mask him, use succinylcholine, and give him uh, propofol, lidocaine, and fentanyl, and let it wear off, and then usually they're able to get a certain degree um, that they can flex. So after induction, it was, it was fairly unremarkable. The first sign of trouble we had was we didn't have any twitches at uh, 10 minutes. And I've gotten in the habit of using the twitch monitor on induction just to remind myself to check. And I put a timer in my phone. And uh, I found at 10 minutes, this was kind of the first sign of trouble that we ran into. So how we treated this was we gave a, an additional 40 milligrams of propofol as our diagnosis was either the twitch monitor is faulty, we have atypical pseudocolon anesterase, either heterozygous or homozygous, um, or a medication swap. Um, I knew it wasn't a medication swap based on the double-labeled syringes for all my paralytics. So uh, we'd, we checked additionally at 15 minutes, and we had one twitch, and then we checked at 17 minutes, and then we had four out of four twitches. So his twitches were uh, regained. He didn't require any more propofol. Um, but he was diagnosed clinically, not uh, with laboratory results, with atypical pseudocholinesterase of a heterozygote origin. The important things to know about this clinically is that the timing of your succinylcholine is going to be roughly, 10, or roughly 20 to 25 minutes uh, after induction with a normal dose of one milligram per kilogram. Um, nothing else too complicated. Uh, in that case, but it leads to this next case, which is more interesting. You can see here his risk for surgery was very low. Uh, the next case was a 55-year-old morbidly obese uh, patient having uh, ankle surgery for being flat-footed. She was not the uh, typical healthy patient, uh, BMI of 45, high blood pressure. She's a chimney as a smoker, insulin-dependent insulin diabetes, and GERD. On top of it, she had one of the most non-reassuring airway exams that I've seen outside of OB anesthesia. She had a malampati 4, uh, short thyromental distance, poor prognathic ability. We were debating on doing an awake intubation, but we felt that her mouth opening was reasonable enough that we could get a glidescope in. Of note that I think was interesting is her brother had a bad reaction to anesthesia. Never been, vent uh, didn't require a ventilator, an ICU admission, but it was over in Iran. Um, and I thought that that was an interesting finding in my preoperative evaluation. So the first sign of trouble is the same sign of trouble that we had in the first case. So 10 minutes in, we didn't have any twitches, but to give context, we had a two hour case. Um, so I set a timer in my phone for 30 minutes. And of note, after 30 minutes, I had no twitches on the facial nerve. Um, I thought it was interesting. I checked the twitch monitor on myself. Uh, it worked. Um, and then I checked on the ulnar, and I also didn't have any twitches. As we continued down, 60 minutes in, I started to get very faint twitches, but they were very, very non-reassuring. I mean, the eyebrow barely would move, and then there was no response at the, at the ulnar nerve. Um, this is after induction, of course, with succinylcholine. So we're about 60 minutes into the case, and I text Dr. Johnson, who was my attending at the time, and I said, I believe we have a homozygous, uh, atypical pseudocholinesterase patient, and if I'm correct, we're going to need sedation for at least four hours. The time of induction was at 10 o'clock. And so we ran into a logistical problem. Uh, we're at an outpatient center with no ICU, we have a diagnosis that requires sedation for four to eight hours. Some case studies even say 16 hours. Um, we don't have pressure support over there, so we can't really wake her up and see how she does. We can try, but we run the risk of awareness under paralysis. Um, and also, she's a difficult mass ventilation and also a tenuous airway in a 60-pack year smoker. So our subsequent decision making, uh, oops. Our subsequent decision making was we're going to sit on this lady and see it in an hour after sedation to see how she does. So we tried waking her up and she desatted to the 80s. Um, 
was very, very weak, barely followed commands, and I made the clinical decision that this is probably a homozygous, a typical pseudocolonesterase patient. We try again an hour later, try and wake the patient up, same result, desaturations, um, required albuterol, some ketamine, uh, as she was also bronchospastic. So now we run into the situation of now what do we do? So I talked to Dr. Johnson and I recommended the uh, critical care ambulance with a transport to the ICU as this patient was likely going to require four more hours or more of sedation. So we had a critical care ambulance come. Additional problems hit where they don't have the ability to administer propofol. They also don't have dexamethamine or any sedation, which is what this diagnosis would need as far as its treatment plan. So um, I rode in on the ambulance and just pushed kind of Q3 propofols. We didn't have an infusion, and I just mass ventilated. She did have one desaturation uh, in route that was responsive to ketamine and also five mics of epinephrine, um, as she had a very tenuous uh, uh, bronchospasm. So once we get to the ICU, uh, I go back to the uh, bone center and then come back at 8 o'clock. And she had passed her SBT, and I wanted to get a reliable twitch monitoring before we extubated the patient, even though she passed. And we did a twitch view monitor, which showed a train of four of 100%. Um, after we woke her up, uh, I talked about getting labs and then also talking to the family that she was likely, based on an autosomal dominant um, inheritance pattern for most of these cases, likely all first degree relatives need to be tested with dibucane and atypical pseudocholinesterase. Which brings us to our next uh, kind of conundrum. So we drew the pseudocholinesterase and dibucane in the morning. So this was 24 hours. And a, a normal dibucane number is above 80. So typically a dibucane number of 20 to 40 is typical for this type of presentation. Um, what are your guys' thoughts, I guess, rhetorically for a, for a moment? Because I was just totally perplexed as to why this could be. And I called the lab, and you cannot draw these labs 48 hours uh, within a 48-hour window of pushing succinylcholine. So if you do have any of these patients, they need to be tested outpatient because the circulating succinylcholine will mask the dibucane number here. Nonetheless, I put succinylcholine on the allergy list. I don't think she needs to get retested. I think you would be an idiot to push succinylcholine again. Um, but um, that is kind of our, our case. And I wanted to discuss one more, one more thing. There is a difference in epic of pseudocholinesterase deficiency and atypical pseudocholinesterase enzyme. Pseudocholinesterase deficiency is associated with a pathology of decreased quantitative values of that pregnancy, liver disease, et cetera. An atypical pseudocholinesterase enzyme is a qualitative disorder with a normal level of enzyme. And I thought that that was important just for understanding of the disease. And I think that's, yeah. That's Are there any questions so far? OK. Um, I'm going to do a little quick presentation on some more facts about what Kyle just talked about. Um,